ask you a... You do? Yeah. I'm not quite sure how it applies. I'm so new to all of this. It's been recording so for a while. Oh, wow. Um, I don't know. It's here in September. I don't know. Ready? Yep. Okay. So, thanks for coming tonight, and definitely thanks to Code for Boston Leadership for allowing me to present tonight. My name is Michael Caveney, and I'm a free stack, uh, free stack developer from here in Boston. I'm going to be talking about GraphQL. This is going to be a pretty high-level talk aimed at developers who haven't really experienced GraphQL before. I want to really hone in on the why of like, why it happened. We're going to be talking about what GraphQL is. Uh, what preceded it that actually made it necessary, uh, what it's great at, what it's not so great at, and some of the tools that go along with the ecosystem. So, let's get started. GraphQL is described by the official website as a query language for your APIs. It can also be described as a specification. If I had to explain GraphQL to someone who wasn't technical at all whatsoever, I would just say it's a more flexible, declarative way of working with data over the internet. So GraphQL gets its name because it uses graph theory, which is mathematical theory that has to do with nodes that are connected to each other. I mentioned this basically as trivia. You really don't need to know GraphQL. You don't need to know graph theory to understand GraphQL. I will add a slight caveat that like a lot of new technologies, GraphQL is pretty jargon heavy. That jargon steeps way up if you're working with the Gatsby static site generator, which uses GraphQL on its like backend queries. And in my experience, I think a little bit of a grounding with graph theory will help you if you're planning on like really getting to know Gatsby. Having said that, so GraphQL was initially developed at Facebook back in 2012. They were converting over their new speed API for the iOS, and they were having a lot of problems with it at the time. This is recounted pretty exactly in the GraphQL documentary, which is available on YouTube. I will be making reference tonight to a lot of external links. Um, I have all those collected. At the end of the night, I'm going to dump a link to my repo, and that'll be with the show notes. So GraphQL was released by Facebook for public use in 2015. So, a question we want to ask ourselves when we're thinking about a developing technology is like, who's using it? Is this going to be a flash in the pan or has there been actual adoption for it? There have been some pretty big adopters of GraphQL. Like some I've picked up right now is GitHub has famously gone over to it. Uh, the GitHub API is one of the more visible public face and GraphQL APIs you can play around with right now. Um, it's always good to see that GraphQL's inventor, Facebook, is using it in-house and continues to. Shopify, one of the biggest Rails apps in the world, is using it right now. And as mentioned before, Gatsby makes heavy use of GraphQL on its back end for data fetching. So definitely some major players. So before we can talk about GraphQL, we have to know what happened before. So we have to rewind five or so years, back to the days when like REST was the main standard for doing anything with data on the internet. So REST is, stands for Representational State Transfer for those who haven't encountered it before. If you've worked with Rails, .NET, any major framework beforehand, web framework, like you're familiar with it. Um, some things that categorize it are like multiple endpoints to fetch certain data, like users, or a blog resource, or you know subscriptions to something. Um, so there are a lot of methods in ways of doing things in the RESTful way that map to HTTP verbs, like putting data, getting, deleting data, patching it, what have you. Um, there's statelessness, which means that just we can only represent state. It's right there in the name. Like we can't transfer it over the internet. So I'm curious, is there anybody here tonight who's worked as a back-end developer who's had particular pains with RESTful conventions before? Nobody? Bueller? Okay. <laughs> there have been complaints about RESTfulness. So the standard was created around 2000, if I'm getting my dates correctly. 
So what that looks like is, I mentioned multiple endpoints, and they are multiple endpoints. So when you have like different resources, major features of your app, you need to create and maintain those resources separately. So that's something that you have to think about. Uh, you're completely reliant on what the server <coughs> sends to you via data, which doesn't really seem like much of a disadvantage until you stop and think about it. Like, would it be helpful if you went to the supermarket and they told you what you could buy? It's kind of not unlike that. Like, there are a lot of cases where that is just fine, but it is a restriction nonetheless. Um, so you don't always have the kind of granular control that would be helpful when you're working with data with REST. You might have to like overfetch it or underfetch it, depending on like how your APIs are structured. This is a pain point that came up as we had to place more demands on like what we're doing with it. And finally, there's the problem of versioning. So a REST API needs to be versioned when there are major breaking changes to it, and that can create a headache for you, it can create a headache for your customers. Now fortunately, GraphQL almost point for point addresses these concerns. When you're working with a GraphQL API, there's one endpoint, usually something like slash GraphQL, and any resources you deal with fall underneath that banner. So this is really helpful for another reason that I'm gonna detail later on. Um, you have very subtle, fine control over the data you request and send. I'm gonna show you an example of this in a minute. Like you can get exactly what you want when you want it. This is very helpful if you have an architecture where you have data that shows up in multiple places, like maybe paired with like different points, so you can get exactly that, not have to send like more data over your pipes to your customers, what have you. Uh, so because of the single endpoint, like you don't have to worry about versioning. You just change your resources as they need to happen, and that's it. Like you have all the version you need right there. Um, another thing that's mentioned that is good to mention is because it's more explicitly for the web and to work specifically with data, there are stronger types that go with GraphQL with REST that we will see in a minute. So on the subject of that type system, if you've worked with a programming language before, the types for the most part aren't going to be very surprising. There are objects which are like the thusly named objects in JavaScript or a dictionary in Python, whatever hash table those are called in the language that you're most familiar with. Um, the scalar types are the primitives of GraphQL. There is an integer, a float, string, boolean, and an ID. There are numerables and there are interfaces which you are going to be familiar with if you've worked with TypeScript. Um, so GraphQL uses a schema definition language similar to that of TypeScript or the Mongoose ORM for MongoDB. Um, unfortunately, I'll get to that in a second. So there are three major operation types that you need to worry about or think about in GraphQL. There's a query which is basically the get request. This is what you're, when you're just asking for data. When you need to change, update, or delete a resource, like the cut of the crud, that's going to be taken care of by mutations. Uh, the final major operation type, which is another clear child of the modern web or subscriptions, which is real-time listening for data and changing things in the database according to that. Uh, funnily enough, the vanilla docs don't really talk about subscriptions that much, which is not something I realized this morning until today, but at any rate, when you're studying, something I want to mention is that there are basic concepts you need to learn, but the exact implementation syntax-wise is going to differ a lot depending on like what kind of wrapper or language you're using, so generally it's best, I think, to understand what these things are than just like drill down and like whatever stack you're in. So unfortunately, because of limitations with the CIC, can't do live coding for you, but what we're looking at here is Graphical, which is an interactive tool that lets you test and explore your data. 
So generally what it looks like is on the left hand, there's an input window. On the right hand, we're getting returns of things. And graphical also features a schema that lets you explore, like double check what operations, like what objects and fields happen inside GraphQL. So for the most part, a query, and for the most part, mutations and subscriptions look like the left-hand side of JSON, but you just type in most the versions of the data you want, and you get back, you know, exactly what you asked for. And this is where the power of GraphQL comes in when you're requesting things. Like, you just need, with a few little lines of code, like you just change something, you get entirely new results, you paste that query into like whatever you're using and like you're good. So let's talk about when GraphQL might not be the best choice for you. So some disadvantages are that, for one thing, unlike basic HTTP and RESTful conventions, there's no basic caching built in. The caveat for this is I don't think it's that much of a disadvantage. For the most part, you are going to be using GraphQL with some kind of wrapper like Apollo, and these tools are going to have built-in solutions to take care of caching, so you wouldn't need to worry about that that, that much. I think a bigger potential problem is that it is, could be total overkill for whatever you're planning for your application, right? So let's use the example of blogs. Let's say you're building the ultimate blog application like ever seen on the internet. You're going to destroy Medium WordPress. You're going to have a lot of like metadata and tags and like bells and whistles all over the place, data flying around left and right. This is a great use case for GraphQL. If you just want to add a blog to your portfolio to get hired, like you're fine with Rails. Like you don't need to reinvent the wheel in this particular case. And on that note, like the other simple thing is you know, REST might be working just fine for you and your team. There could be like no need whatsoever for you to change over. And so with that, let's talk about some of the tools and utilities that belong in the GraphQL ecosystem. Uh, if you have a language, there's a server library for it on the GraphQL website. Uh, there are implementations for this. They also talk about this on a companion site called How to GraphQL, which has a lot of tutorials in various environments, but Python, Ruby, JavaScript, Java, Elixir, C Sharp, like if your language works on the web, like there is a GraphQL implementation <coughs> for it out there somewhere. Um, so there's Prisma, which is the GraphQL ORM. Does anybody here not know what an ORM is? Okay, so an ORM is an object relational mapping. It's basically a layer that's designed to like work with the database language and do a lot of commonly done operations. An example of this might be Entity in C Sharp or Mongoose with MongoDB. So Prisma is an ORM that goes with GraphQL. Again, uh, setup can be a little hairy, but for a lot of common operations, it saves you quite a bit of work. Prisma also makes a slightly nicer version of the graphical called GraphQL Playground. It's basically like the sublime text or the VS Code to Notepad++. It does the same thing, but it looks a little nicer and it might have some extra features. How many people here are JavaScript devs or work with it primarily? Okay, good. Um, a major, major tool for GraphQL is Apollo GraphQL. So this was created by the team that created the Meteor.js React framework. Uh, what Apollo does is provides you a massive suite of tools for working with the front end code, the back end, lots of other things. There is, but that's not what makes it so great. Uh, there was a lot of thought put in ahead of time to what developers would be able to use, which is why Apollo has things like a state management system that's pretty much identical to Redux. If you know Redux, you'll be good with this one. It has wrappers for your APIs that are RESTful, so you don't have to worry about the pain of switching everything over at once. Uh, if you're, you should definitely check out GraphQL, it is great. So, hopefully I've given you something to think about in terms of the possibilities of GraphQL, and let's talk about where you can learn more. If you like books, 
Uh, Eve Forcello and Alex Banks's Learn GraphQL. Learning GraphQL is outstanding. Like it's a short book that packs, packs a lot of information into a like, pretty short time. It was invaluable for me for making sure I had the concepts in this talk really crystallized. Uh, I mentioned the GraphQL documentary. So this was done by a European company, Honey Pot. It's a half hour. They talked to the three creators who were working at Facebook at the time of the creation of GraphQL, and it goes in depth into what they were thinking and like why this need arose. Podcast resources I would recommend is the Ladybug Podcast has an episode called What the Heck is GraphQL? That's helpful if you have no contact with GraphQL whatsoever because they have very, several experts talk briefly about the various facets of the specification. So that'd be helpful to wrap your head around if you just need to hear it a certain way. Uh, Wes Boss and Scott Talinsky's Syntax FM has two episodes that I think are of note. There's one, episode 27, that's entirely about GraphQL. There's a more recent one that's basically is a deep dive into API, which obviously GraphQL is heavily discussed. On Udemy, uh, I would recommend Andrew Mead's Modern GraphQL Boot Camp. Andrew has a pretty disciplined style in terms of work, lecture, testing your knowledge that helps things retain. This is mostly a back end course that talks about the basics of GraphQL. Prisma spends a little bit of time talking about Apollo, but it is pretty good. <coughs> uh, on front end masters. If you think that you would benefit from learning about graph theory, uh, check out Bianca, Bianca Gandolfo's Tree and Graph Data Structure lectures. Uh, type CEO Scott Moss has two courses, both on GraphQL and advanced GraphQL. Scott is the king of the minimum effective dose when it comes to teaching. He can break down really large subjects like Node, like that, and like really convey what's important. And that is all I have, so thank you all. Um, I'm going to be posting the show notes and links on the Slack. Does anybody have any questions? You mentioned subscriptions. Can you talk a little bit more about those? Like, is that for clients to subscribe to the GraphQL uh, backend, or is it for listening for gathering data into the? Graph? Sure. So it's watching for data. Like, do you have any information? Uh, do you have familiarity with RxJS? or the observable pattern. Okay, so it's basically a piece of code that says, I am watching this, I am watching like, the database, and when a new client signs up, then I will perform these operations. So it's basically reactive code. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's not, like some things, like it kind of tells you what it's doing, but like most tech jargon, it kind of doesn't. So, yeah. Is there like a third database? No, it's. I probably should have mentioned that it's extremely flexible. You can hook just about anything up to it, and if you're using a tool like Apollo, you can hook your old REST API up to it and get as little or as much as you need from it. But you can work with pretty much any database. Like there are some tools. So Prisma you can use with anything. Apollo is JavaScript specific, but there will be like other things. Like if you're working with Elixir, you would use AppSim. But um, as far as like, can I use MongoDB? Can I use Postgres? Can I use MySQL? It's all of the above. Does it have migration? I'm sorry, I didn't mean uh, to blurt it out. Go ahead. No worries. Uh, I was going to ask so, does each um, table in a database get its own GraphQL endpoint, or is it like a single endpoint? And so, then... it's a single endpoint that basically views everything underneath it as resources. Um, mm -hmm. So unfortunately, because I lost code samples, so um, so basically, like let's say you were creating authentication, so you would have for your site. So let's say you have an object, let's say like type user. So it have what are some things you would have in there? Like you would have like name, you would have a user ID, uh, you'd have a password, you'd have an email, you'd have whatever else is necessary by like the business requirements that you have mm -hmm. and like that would just be like a resource that manages and like any other like database you can have you know like 
one to many or like many to many, like anything you can do with a re relational database, you can model and graph as well. Yes? I tend to just blurt out my question. Sorry, Sorry about that. Um, did, so are there like, I think of migrations, I think of an RM, I think of that we have to run some sort of migration so that the database can talk to this layer. Mm. How does it, how does it, how do you start with a Postgres database and end up with this big object that you could talk to in GraphQL? I think of it as a big object, right? A big tree of data. Right. Um, so when you're talking about migrations, you're talking about like say like the migrations the way we know them, Rails. Yeah, for, for an example, yeah. Um, I don't think it demands quite that level of granularity. How does it, so, the, so GraphQL just, just looks at my database and figures out these nodes of data to talk to. Um, it's more that, I mean like, yeah, you would have to do, like, do the work of schema, but like you would just like map it to it. Um, and again, like the implementation details like, will differ depending on like what you're doing. Um, so actually, having said that, that is a good question. I have spent some time playing around with the GraphQL gem. Um, if Rails is like other languages, implementation details of how you work with data might be disrupted less than you would expect. I was actually a little surprised by, for the most part, like how not that different mm -hmm. GraphQL Rails code looks from like your standard Rails code base. Yeah. Thanks. Anything else? Is there a way to do like multiple pages of results? Yeah, pagination is something that's talked about. Where did I run into pagination? Uh, Prisma has a very specific technique for doing it. I believe there is some discussion of it in the docs, but usually uh, that feature starts with whatever abstraction we use, but it's pretty common. So if you built an application that had uh, ORM so that it can map all the objects to or if it had some kind of plan that you could implement GraphQL as an interface for accessing that information, like you would have a SAPI or Exactly. Yeah. Anything else? I'm good. Thanks y'all. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.